Iowa football releasing its week two depth chart. No change at quarterback. Spencer Peter is still QB1. We'll get to it in a moment and some of the items that stood out on that release. And kind of interesting, the university had to release it twice. Apparently a faulty version released earlier in the afternoon. We'll get to it in a moment. But first, I want to remind you to please hit that like button. The thumbs up does help the channel, does help us. Uh, and the more viewers, the more support, donations, uh, thumbs up, uh, comments, everything helps the channel to grow and helps us to produce more content, more great guests, live streams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also want to tell you about Ascent Nutrition and their uh, Ascent Coffee. This stuff is great. It's mold and mycotoxin free. I know we got a lot of guys watching this show and certainly men and women alike appreciate a good cup of coffee in the morning. And certainly you don't want to be doing anything to harm your health. Well, those molds and mycotoxins will do just that. Check out GoAscentNutrition.com. This stuff is great tasting. It's pure. It's clean. Use the code Hawkeyes for 15% off. GoAscentNutrition.com. All right, so the Hawkeyes uh, released their week two depth chart and no change at the top. Spencer Petrus still listed as the number one quarterback over quarterback number two, Spencer or Alex Padilla, excuse me. And of course, I think this uh, goes contrary to what most people want, right? I think most people in the fan base, I should say at least a lot of people in the fan base are to the point where they want something different. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I'm to the point where I believe all the stops should be pulled out. Yes, you're one to know, but it's not a matter of being one to know. It's a matter of the offensive production or lack thereof that we've seen now for, well, you could just argue the last year, but even going back into the first few years of the Brian Ferentz era, even that 2017 year um, with uh, the big blowout over Ohio State, man, that also produced the Wisconsin game in which Iowa couldn't move the ball. I don't think Nate Stanley had over 100 yards passing in that game. So it's not like uh, this is a one-year thing carried over into 2022 this is an ongoing thing and i think uh we're getting to the point where time is running out i think it's ran out but that's a discussion maybe for a different day spencer's your qb1 let's take a look at the depth chart what's interesting before we actually get to the imagery here i'll show you the depth chart the university released a depth chart uh earlier in the afternoon and then not long after they released another depth chart that was a revised depth chart apparently the first one was inaccurate I guess I don't really know why it matters if what Kirk Ferentz says is true that uh, these depth charts don't mean much. Why did we feel the need to release a second one? I don't have the answer to that question, but let's look at both of them and we'll kind of point out some highlights. So the old depth chart is on your left. Now that's old, meaning the one that was released first this afternoon. And you see a notable there, Keegan Johnson listed as your uh, number one receiver. And, um, What's interesting is you look on the right side, the revised depth chart, no Keegan Johnson. So I don't expect him to play. No Nico Reganey on either. So Iowa will once again be with Arlen Bruce, the only scholarship player at wide receiver with real experience in a game. Alec Wick is listed on both. He'll get time again. And uh, Jack Johnson listed on the second one because of the uh, removal of Keegan Johnson. But here's a name that's interesting. Brody Brecht, the Ankeny kid, who, of course, is a star pitcher for the Iowa baseball team. Now, he works into the depth chart. And Brody, of course, a bigger receiver. You're kind of prototypical X receiver. He's missed some time due to injury. Is he up to speed on the offense? Well, it's uh, not the hardest position to learn at the college level. So maybe Brody can produce, you know, here's a guy who is on scholarship. You love to see that. So can Brody Brecht help the offense? Boy, that'd be a great story. You see a couple changes along that offensive line on the first depth chart that was released. Nick DeYoung was listed as your starting left guard with Matt Fagan, or excuse me, with Tyler Ellsbury backing him up on the second depth chart. You've got Ellsbury starting and Matt Fagan backing him up. Interesting right guard. Bo Stevens listed as your starter on the first depth chart with Matt Fagan backing him up. And then the second depth chart, Colby, not at right tackle, but at right guard with Bo Stevens backing him up. Isn't this interesting? I just, I'm not trying to read too far into this, but I do find it just uh, very intriguing. The fact that uh, there were multiple depth charts released and apparently uh, the first one was not accurate. The first depth chart that was released had, uh, Connor Colby listed as your starting right tackle with Plum backing him up. And on the second depth chart, Plum starting with DeYoung backing him up. So all kinds of juggling. What does it mean? I, I don't really know. I mean, does it mean that uh, 
maybe uh, the internal depth chart is different than the depth chart that we're getting, and maybe somebody accidentally released one that uh, was not supposed to be released. I have no idea. That That's uh, uh, certainly a, a, t- a question that we'll pr- probably never have answered, and it probably won't matter here in a week or two. But as I mentioned, Spencer Petrus is your QB1. One interesting item here that uh, was added to the, both jet charts that were released today, a difference from last week, is that finally we get some clarification on specialists. Of course, we didn't know who was returning kickoffs or punts or even holding on uh, long snaps on field goal tries. And so now we know that uh, you've got Tory Taylor, who is technically your uh, starting holder. Cooper DeGene, who got some time doing that in the spring and in the fall. He's an intriguing guy because of his athleticism. And I think he certainly has proven at the high school level to be able to throw the football. Could he be an interesting candidate at holder? He's listed here. Luke Elkin is your long snapper punt return duties. Uh, we saw those uh, being handled by Arlen Bruce this past week, but Cooper DeGene and Alec Wick both listed as or candidates at punt return. So in other words, apparently no clear starter, but I do think Bruce, you know, the fact that he played that uh, first week, I expect him to continue to take those duties on. Riley Moss returning kicks. You've got Cooper DeGene and Arlen Bruce listed. Neither one of the Williams running backs listed there. That's a little bit surprising to me. So that's your depth chart. Just takeaways in general. Iowa going to continue to uh, have to deal with uh, the departures, or I shouldn't say the departures, but the absences of both Keegan Johnson and Nico Regani. And this is a game where, look, South Dakota State certainly challenged Iowa's offense, and that's a problem, certainly. That's not their stronger unit, at least not perceived to be South Dakota State uh, their stronger unit. But they did certainly make it hard on Iowa receivers, specifically the pass rush, I thought, really affected Spencer Petras his inability to step up in the pocket and make a play when pressure comes from the outside, or certainly his ability inability to make a nice throw when pressure comes and hits him square in the in the uh, jaw, so to speak, that continues to be an issue. And yes, pass protection was a problem, but folks, I, I just, you know, you hope that they can come up with a combination. And I've said this like every year, just about minus 2020, which was a bit of an anomaly, I think because of COVID and just was a weird year. Other teams were dealing with a lot of uh, attrition and just problems in general with the virus and personnel. But I've been saying that I said this in 2019, I said it in 2021, and now I'm saying it again so far, one game in in 2022, these Uh, problems up front along that offensive line are not going to fix themselves and they're not going to be fixed overnight. I don't think they're going to be fixed. Now, this may be the biggest jump they'll make as far as improvement from week one to week two. We always hear that mantra from coaches that your biggest improvement is made from the first game to the second game. But a lot of these issues, you think that they have to be fixed in the off season and some of them are strength and conditioning. Some of them are just coaching. And so if they haven't been fixed, I mean, I I don't know how you can be as bad as you were week one and all of a sudden just turn it on and light it up from a pass protection and run blocking standpoint in week two. I just don't expect that to happen. I hate to rain on people's parades, but I I think, uh, boy, the offensive line, uh, we got some problems. So uh, I don't know what that means, but I I do know that uh, Spencer Petrus did not look any better throwing, um, you know, in in, in the face of pressure. And that's a problem moving forward. LaShawn Williams ran well week one. You see Gavin Williams is listed. or maybe That was one we didn't bring up, actually. Gavin Williams is listed on the depth chart finally. So that's good news. Louis Steck was also listed. He's a guy I brought up. Nobody doesn't want to talk about Louis Steck. He played a lot at Kids Day, was with the ones a lot during fall camp. He is listed as your backup um, at uh, defensive tackle behind Logan Lee. So not sure what the status of YA Black is, but he's a guy who was playing well during fall camp, but now Steck listed on the depth chart. No sign of Aaron Graves. But again, Louis Steck uh, had proven himself, and he's not a a real big guy, but he is tough by all accounts. People who have talked about him have described him as a just tough guy. It's nice to see uh, Quinn Schulte have a nice game during week one, and he's back on the depth chart during week two. I was right about Xavier Wampa. I'm glad to to be right that he was going to play a lot on special teams. We'll have to see how much he starts to mix in on defense. Same with Aaron Graves. But it's hard when you, you're winning a game 7-3 to three and you have guys that you don't necessarily trust yet because they're young. I get that. But that's why you shouldn't be in a 7-3 to three game against any FCS opponent. And that's exactly what Iowa found themselves in. Logan Klemp listed as your, your Leo linebacker. He's a guy from Jewel, just north of uh, us here in Story County. And that means that Justin Jacobs not on the depth chart. He left game one 
with an injury. We'll wait to see what uh, Kirk Ferentz says on uh, Justin Jacobs, but that's disappointing and, and tough because Justin Jacobs had his coming out party against the Cyclones last year in 2021 in Ames. And so I think matchup wise, he fits the mold of what you want um, at that position in a game like this. Iowa State, of course, without Brees Hall and no Brock Purdy, but Iowa State likes to run the football, right? They're not going to go just purely pass heavy, even with Deckers, who I think might be a, a more pure, a pure passer than a Brock Purdy was. So it's disappointing not to have Justin Jacobs out there, but Injuries aside, I think, uh, you know, that's that's one to watch. Jermari Harris also not listed. He was suspended week one for the OWI. Where is he? He's not on here either. So hopefully we get some of these questions answered at Kirk Ferentz's uh, weekly press conference. And my guess is, my guess is that the quarterback position is going to come up during his week two press conference. And folks, if Iowa loses to Iowa State and it's due to the offense, pitchforks, and torches the fans are getting restless folks and maybe there's some defenders still out there but a lot of fans are getting really restless and i can tell just from some of the comments and the activity on this channel and over on our sister channel iowa football the voice of college football and you have every right to be upset especially if you're a paying fan i don't care if you paid for one game if you got season tickets if you're a ten thousand dollar donor if you're a hundred thousand dollar a year donor you have a right to be upset and expect change. Are we seeing change? I have no evidence to believe that, but we'll have to wait and see. Big game, folks. And we're going to be talking about it the rest of the week. Appreciate you tuning in for another segment of the show. A reminder to please like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell for updates when I'm going live and post new content. And we'll talk to you soon.